ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ Tony? Yes, sir? Tony, I'm, like, really excited about this tonight. You know, this one, this should be a very good show, I think. And I know that you're probably, you have a frustration level with my, I've got somebody that's new in the hobby. <laughs> There's a new company in the hobby. This is, you know, and you're like, how can there, you know, how much more can there still be, or where do I find? This guy is going to be making an HO scale Shea steam locomotive. He's got double O stuff for the, not double O like Sean Connery, but double O scale, like 176 for the UK market. HO for North America is new. That Shea is first. It's a modern, there's so much. And this is a brand new company. And when he first contacted me, he said he was getting into the hobby and I saw his name and his last name was Ravel or he said something. I thought, oh, my gosh, Ravel's coming back. Oh, I loved all those old things Ravel made. Right. And then realized, oh, it's better than that. It's all new stuff. So I'm I'm, and he's I I, this is amazing, too. He's Canadian based. Uh, Does he have a does he have a website? He does have a website. It's KR Models. Dot .ca which i guess you guys up there have ca so people a know you're canada is that right uh, hey. <laughs> uh, look at that he's making noise before he's been introduced <laughs> well we have that two way speaker in the green room yeah, i might have left yeah. it open yeah i got a feeling this guy's going to be nothing but trouble from the word you know i i don't know i don't know but you know he's he's another one of these people that i think has taken the, our hobby <clears throat> to yet another level He's making way too much noise. Do you think? Well, you yeah. were complaining I was making too much noise before. <laughs> that was because you were doing your heavy breathing. Hey, you know what I always want? You know what I always wanted to do is uh, I always wished I could. I wanted to be like Merv Griffin and say, our next guest needs no introduction. Remember how they used to always do that? Our next they would guest. always do that. Yeah. Yeah. But then they would turn around and say, you know them from yeah. these yeah. movies, their TV show, their record. It's like, well, you just said they needed no introduction. Yeah. And but then be, they would anyway. And then it'd be like Clint Eastwood or somebody. Right. There's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of great Dick Cavett YouTube videos. Have you ever watched any of those? Oh, I can go down that rabbit hole quite a bit. Watching Tonight Show and like Dick Cavett and, you know, different talk shows and things. And it it's fun too to see, you know, I said UK. I always like to see some of the American TV or movie people either on like something in Germany or England or like Japan when they're on like a, you know, a Today Show someplace else because it's always interesting how it's done and you can tell they're a little off base. It's like, this is not how we do this in the U.S. There's a lot of, you know, they'll be a little different or more colorful than our kind of dry delivery on things, I guess. So you found this, uh, it's, it's KR Models, and you found them because they contacted you. I believe so, yes. Or I saw I saw somewhere something about the Shea, and I can't remember if I emailed him or he emailed me about the same time I saw some rumblings about it. And I said, oh, you got to be kidding. Well, I got to know more about this. There's only ever been one uh, HO scale, Shea, isn't it? That Bachman one from like 30 years ago? Uh, in bigger scales, yeah. I mean, in Shea and HO, I think there was a model die casting roundhouse. Oh, and yeah. That, naturally, there's that was a big thing for Pacific Fast Mail. Ten Shoto oh, yeah. in Japan made a hand. That was like one of their first signature pieces. But, you know, it's such an intricate thing that, yeah, it's not like there's a half dozen of them already on the market that it'll be very interesting to see, you know, how this what this one is. It's prototype. And I know he'll be able to tell us a little bit about, you know, that because there are various ones um, because I started doing more studying on that and getting interested in them because we've got a book coming out at White River Productions on the Shea locomotives. And then he announced this one at the same time. And. I started digging through my Pacific Fast Mail catalogs and saw all these two-truck shays and different things that have been done. And it's like, oh, this is a, a very interesting topic. So, but yes. So, without further ado, and someone who needs no introduction. Yeah. <laughs> His name <laughs> is Keith Ravel. Come on in, Keith. Hi, guys. Where's the drum roll? Oh. 
Oh, like you know. Well, what did you think that was? Did you not hear it? Well, yeah, well, I, I heard the tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> the, the drum, the drum roll guy gets the first Monday off of the month or something, and I think he's he didn't get it. How this does month's he know there yet. was? How does he know there wasn't a drum roll? <laughs> Has he never heard of editing? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah. all. That's all done in post. Yeah, he yeah. seems. Yeah. He seems. An, he seems annoying already. Oh, yeah, he does. I'm telling you, yeah. the guy yeah. seems annoying already. He's like, "Where's the drum roll? The guy's ever first time ever on the podcast. Where's my drum roll? <laughs> well, the, the guy's starting a new hobby company. You know, I mean, think of this takes this takes some real initiative and effort here. So you know, you got to have that confidence. So where's his drum roll? Is I'd it, like to know myself. Is this a new company? Is it just started? Uh, no, we, we actually launched um, back in 2018 in the UK market and European market. Um, we're new to uh, bringing out North American-based products, yes. And so in 2018, you started – so you were in the UK, were you? Uh, no, I, I've actually been in the uh, in the snowy north of, uh, uh, of Canada since 2009. So you immigrated to Canada in 2009? Yep, yep. With the intent that nine years later you'd start a, a locomotive uh, production a co- a company, absolutely. That was my first agenda. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I I came over for other work opportunities, and uh, you know, um, you know, just you know, really, really settled down and really got into it. And then um, because obviously, you know, you guys have basements over here, places to expand your train layouts and everything. Um, I, I could really expand on my on my hobby, and then it got to the point where I wanted models that were not available. So uh, we then started doing research on how can we bring the models that I want to see on my layout uh, out to the general public. So um, we found some drawings in a dusty spider filled room uh, for our uh, first model. And um, the rest, as they say, is history. It basically, just exploded after that. We haven't made a name for ourselves for bringing out uh, models that no one else has seen, that, or at least not for a good while, um, that really need some, you know, modern day touches and tooling and and you know, care and and, uh, and and fine detail to actually, you know, make a model that's actually worth buying now. So how do you? So these, uh, I don't recognize <clears throat> your name. So you made. North American models, or you made uh, British models? Uh, we made British models uh, uh, to start off with. We've got um, uh, three that's been delivered this year. Uh, we've got another nine in various stages of uh, production. Um, so yeah, we've uh, you know we've we've just exploded, you know, uh, exponentially right now. As far as the North American market goes, we've currently got. Uh, five on our uh, website. Uh, got f- uh, four freight cars, the Shea, and uh, we're going to be bringing out another uh, uh, model to complement the Shea, uh, which should be announced later on this year. Um, when about later on this year? Um, probably just before Christmas. We're thinking. Okay, because right now it's about September. This is, yeah, this is yeah. around uh, early fall that you're we're uh, brought, we're talking to the the world right now. So I'm uh, Tony. Yes, sir. Uh, he seems like one of these guys where it's going to be. There's a lot of going to be gaps in the story where we're going to have to keep going doubling back to try to <laughs> fill in the gaps. Because like, I, like why why on earth when you're in Canada is that what you model? Like, have you been a model railroader your whole life? Pretty much, yeah. From from obviously when you know when people end up with uh, uh, you know trains for their first you know uh, birthday or Christmas present or something, and then it just it sits in a box for thirty years, and then you get disposable income because your own kids have moved out. So then you just expand the hobby after that. But yeah, I mean, I've always had an interest in in either preservation railways or uh, you know modeling model railways. I have had models that I've not had anything to do with for, you know, a number of years because of, you know, kids and wives and houses and jobs and things. So now I've got a bit more uh, time and money to uh, develop my own, uh, my own hobby. <clears throat> it's, it's kind of spurned out of there uh, from, from just a general interest within the hobby and, and, and seeing what's not available. So, you know, the technology is there to, to expand, um, the, the the usability and the and the 
for want of a better phrase, the playability of a, of, of having a uh, you know a really good operating layout. All right, let's just slow down here, buddy. <laughs> you're an, you're you're doing fifty and a thirty. Just, you just need to, uh, we need, just a speed demon. Yeah. So were you mo- were you modeling British? Like you moved to Canada and you were modeling uh, British. You were building a British themed layout, or you were model. Yeah. You're building British themed models. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Right. So how would somebody like you, do you have a background? What is, what is your background that would give you the thought process of, well, I'm just going to start make, uh, producing, manufacturing and producing my own models? Uh, I have a lot of good tenacity. So w- w- once I get a hold of something, I don't tend to kind of let it go. And um, I have a good problem-solving logistical uh, demeanor to be able to you know, look at a problem and fix it. So um, the problem was there wasn't any models out there that um, that I wanted on my layout. So then I had to go away and make one. So I thought so, I, I thought model railroading was uh, fairly prevalent in the UK and other parts of Europe. Oh, it is. It's it's a huge industry in the in in uh, Europe. So, uh, so sure. What are, what are these models that that just didn't exist that you felt you had to start producing? Well, one of them, our first model was the English Electric GT3, which effectively looks like a steam locomotive, um, but isn't. It's, a, it's actually a gas turbine, so it sounds like a jet engine. Um, so that that was unusual in its in its entirety because it was only ever a prototype. It was never put into full production. Um, it was scrapped in 1966, so that was two years before I was even born. Um, so... There's the challenge in itself is, well, how do you bring something that doesn't exist? Because most, most model companies will go to a preservation railway or a museum and take the example and draw it up from there. We didn't have that luxury. So we had to go into the archives, into the, the, the National Railway Museum archives, and find the drawings for the model that we wanted to make. What gave you the impression that people wanted a model of a locomotive that never uh, turned a wheel in in revenue service? Um, well, there was two. There was two ways we went about it. One, there's a there's a magazine in the UK that annually does a poll through its readers as to you know what would you like the model companies to make, and the GT3 was always in the top five. Um, so. That in its entirety meant that you know there was some interest in it. We just didn't know how much. So then, when we launched in 2018, we basically just turned up with four photos, a tablecloth, and a guy I knew who actually built a 12th scale version of this thing, um, and basically just presented ourselves at a, at a model railway show, uh, and basically said, "Hey, if you support us, we will build this." So we launched a system. It's 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 actually on our website now on the on for the for the Shea. It's called the Expression of Interest, and the way that works is basically it's a barometer for the for the industry uh, or for the marketplace to see if we launch a model, if we make a model, are people going to receive it in the context that it's meant? You know, like you know, warmly and everything. Um, so when we had the the Expression of Interest open up for the GT3, the website literally crashed. Because there was that many people trying to sign up for the thing, and we and at, that, at that point you, we don't ask for any monies. We don't. We don't. It's not a pre-order system. It's just a you know if if a model doesn't receive enough interest, then we just simply don't put it in the brochure. So wh- where was this model show that you set up with a tablecloth and a table, and where was that? Uh, in Birmingham, uh, in the West Midlands of the UK. It's a it's a it's the biggest show in in uh, in Europe. For model trains, it covers. I think it's something ridiculous, like one hundred and fifty thousand square feet of. Yeah, what's it called? What's it called? The NEC is the exhibition area, and it's called the Wally Railway Show. Yeah, the Wall Wally. Yeah. How yeah. Do you, how do you spell that? W a r l e y. W a r l e y. L e y. I yeah. didn't hear. I didn't hear an R in there when he first. I, uh, I didn't either. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, well. I heard Wally, like as in <laughs> Wally and Cle- and the Beaver. Yeah. Yeah. Or where's Wally? Yeah, and not, yeah. I didn't hear Wally at all. Well, be- bearing in mind this is real English. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, let's not go down that rabbit hole. 
as opposed as opposed to what I'm speaking, where my mother was in, uh, born in England and my father was born in Scotland. What am I speaking then, smart guy? Well, <laughs> the Scottish have a speech impediment anyway, so we're not even going to go down that road. Oh. <laughs> Just don't tell them to speak Celtic. So how many how many how many model railway <laughs> shows have you been to in Great Britain since you started this company in 2018? Um, well, obviously, because of COVID, that, that really put the dampener on things, but it's not stopped sales because uh, all our customers have been at home with nothing better else to do than scour the internet for, for new models and things. So our sales have, have, have rose dramatically, which is handy for us. Uh, but no, in 2019, which was the last year we actually attended shows, we did f- uh, four, four in the UK. We were scheduled to do a further five in 2020, but uh, that's all gone by the wayside we've got three planned for this year uh, in the uk uh tony yes sir i'm telling you right now by the time we're done in an hour and so some, some we're going to be exhausted <laughs> it's, isn't it it's amazing though he did this gt3 electric which again yeah looks like a steam locomotive you've got the it's called the fell it reminds yep. me a little bit it's a dual ended and it's articulated i guess it looks kind of like a real nope. boxy gg1 tell me what that is that that is an ugly piece of engineering but <laughs> as as with all prototypes the outside is basically just a shell to cover the guts in the inside it's actually it actually has six power plants in it wow um there's four paxman uh power engines uh got running through the most complicated transmission system you've ever seen in your life uh, and then there's two auxiliary engines to one power the electrics and the other to power hydraulics. But yes, it's the most ugliest looking thing you've ever seen in your life. And what is it? Where does it date from? You said the electric was scrapped in the mid '60s. What? Yeah, it's, this is actually this actually predates that. It actually huh. caught fire in Manchester uh, in 1958, wow. and it was ne- and it was never repaired. So this is another one of a kind, basically. This is not yep. a wow. Okay. No. Nope, and, nope. and then, then you've got iron ore wagons. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait cars. a minute. I'm not seeing any of this on K- krmodels.ca. <clears throat> you have. You gotta, a- yeah, you need to go over to krmodels.net. Is that right, Keith? And then you'll yeah. get the, the. Yeah. Then you you've got the choice of flags. Then. Yeah. So, so if K- you want, it's krmodels.net. Yeah. Right. And then if you hit the Union Jack on the left side, it'll take you to the UK model. Well, let me see if I can get this working. Oh, there we go. There's a U- Union Jack and a and an American flag. Uh, yep. You see, he's a, typ- a typical uh, a typical from uh, over home, uh, uh, Tony. He doesn't even recognize the Canadian flag because as far as he's concerned, <laughs> the Brits are concerned, Canada is Britain. Uh, well, it is one of the col- it is one of the colonies. I mean, you guys <laughs> did until independence, and so look how that's working out for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So now you start making these UK models. You travel back to Britain several times to go to shows. There's yep. got to be more to this story. It's got to be like. Like, are you just like a billionaire, and you just had money to burn through, or how did you how did you determine? How did you even figure out how to make models to begin with? Well, Google's a fantastic tool because you can pretty much find anything you want on there. So having Googled, um, you know, train manufacturers, I mean, the the, the, <clears throat> the obvious kind of finishing point for that is, is China, unfortunately, because uh, that's where they're all pretty much based right now. Um, so... <clears throat> um basically yeah we we found a factory that we could send the drawings to and say hey guys make this and the rest as they say is history that's basically how it kind of panned out but no as i say to, to actually know whether you've got a successful model that's why we make the expression of interest uh link uh to various models um i mean we 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 had a slow build on one of the ones that's on the on the double o gauge link page that's on the um uk site it's called the Clayton DHP one. Now that's been that's been bubbling away in the background for probably about a year, uh, and we've just we've only just recently opened the order book for that for people to pre-order because it's it was just it just took so long for people to get even enthused about it. But we've got enough uh, potential sales now to bring it out into production because I mean any, any company will tell you why why would you bring something out if there's no marketplace for it? So it would just be business suicide if we brought out a model that. Uh, that no one was going to buy. 
we'd invest all that money in tooling and, pr- and production and uh, advertising, and then no one goes away and buys it. Has the does the expression of interest has that worked? Yeah, you because know, it's not really, as you say, a reservation or a pre order. You're no. just basically telling, yeah, I'd be interested in it, but you're not. There's no feet to the fire. You're not committing to it. Oh, and, that's right. And I, and I do hear that at times from manufacturers of, oh, you know, everybody told us they wanted this or they wanted this road name or they thought this should be made. Then we did it, and it just didn't seem to sell like we expected. So does it follow through that you find the expression of interest is a valid? You know, you, you obviously it's it's worked so far for you. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a business model, my bank manager loves me because I didn't have to go with, to him cap in hand and basically beg for money. <laughs> um, so on on top All of right. the expression whoa, of interest, whoa, whoa, back up. This is like <laughs> <laughs> back. Come this. on, Lionel. <laughs> yeah, we are. back this bus up a couple of stops here, Beep. Tony. This is like uh, this is like our buddy Stephen Atwell, who uh, who obviously hadn't read the book about you can't open a uh, brick and mortar shop and make it successful in 10 years or less. Right. And I like, he just, he Googled, found somebody in China that would make this and it's just happening. Yeah. I mean, this I'm, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, this is a big, don't you understand this industry? He obviously doesn't understand the industry, Keith, or Tony. He's the, uh, he's flabber. He's, He's mm-hmm. flustering me. I don't like that. <laughs> uh, uh, he obviously doesn't understand the industry because it's very hush hush. And to find manufacturers, you don't simply go on Google and go find me a guy that can make uh, HO scale trains in China. I wouldn't think so. And when I first saw the Shea announcement and went to the site, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, right. And then I look at the double O scale models he did for the UK. I'm like, oh, no, wait a minute. He's actually done a number of things, and they all look really good. So, mm-hmm. you know, because anybody, I could put a website up and say, I'm going to make this or that. And it's like, uh-huh, yeah. But it's surprising in a way. And it does, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Looking And the prototypes that he picks, some of these things are just amazingly odd-looking ducks. So I wonder what he'll do for North American things. Uh, so, okay. So the concept iron ore wagons, double O gauge. Yep. How many of those did you make? Uh, we've made just over six thousand. Really? Yes. And is it a? It's a common piece. I'm assuming. Nope. No, it's another nope. odd oddball. It only ran on a very short line in the northeast of England. They only made thirty of them to actually run between the uh, uh, Tyne Tees docks. So from the dock side to the to the foundry. Uh, delivery nine oh. That's all they did, and it, they only ran as a nine car rake as well. Not like the huge two and a half mile, you know, train consist you get here. Right. A, wow. nine, um, a nine car what? Rake. So nine not nine nine freight cars behind a locomotive. <laughs> that was it. So That's rake it. a nine rake must be some sort of British term, is it? Well, it's certainly a modelling term. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> a Tony. Yeah. Tony. Yes, I've heard that. It's the same as like they'd call it a wagon instead of. You know, a freight car, those are the bogeys instead of trucks that, yeah, a rake is. I've heard yep. that before, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's legit. All yeah. right. All right. Um, yep. So you made 6,000 of these, then how did they sell? Like hotcakes. Like hotcakes. Well, yeah. We, come we, on. We, we originally put a budget out of 3,000. We thought, yeah, that's a reasonable figure. You know, we can make some money on that. And uh, we blew that completely out of the water when the order book opened. Uh, These things are just flying off the shelves. I think you lost me at the we went we went to the bank manager and because a bunch <laughs> of people and because a bunch of people said they'd be interested in some HO scale model, he was just happy to turn over a wad of cash. I think that's where you kind of lost me. No, that, that's what I'm saying. That didn't happen. We didn't go to the bank because the way our business model works is that uh, if you go through the purchase process, you have two options to pay in advance which is you can either pay for it all at once or you can use the installment plan. We have a proprietary 0% installment plan. So you can spread the cost of your model as it's being developed. So when do people pay for this thing? Um, typically as the, as the model proceeds. It gives them a, a sense of, of um, commitment to it. So we initially just asked for 50 bucks down. And then, you know, kind of drip feed every couple of months thereafter until the thing's produced. Because, you know, they they take about 30 months to produce from start to finish. Uh, 
uh, there's six months just of tooling, just to get the tooling right. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's like a GoFundMe, and then I'm going to make this cool model for you. Well, not only that, but this is just like he's uh, very, very mm-hmm. interested. So how many... How many people, if you don't, and Keith, any questions I ask that you don't want to, don't feel comfortable answering, which I find hard to believe that there'll be any that he doesn't want to answer. Uh, you're very refreshing. You have a very refreshing attitude, very much like our buddy Stephen Atwell of Midwest Model Railroad right there in Independence, Missouri. Uh, so how many people had ponied up some dough for these uh, wagons before you even started making them? Um. Well, we, as I say, we sell them for a, a rake of nine. We'd, we'd already sold uh, half of the allotment before um, we actually went into tooling. We were still in the design stage. So you'd sold half of them. People had paid yeah. for half of them before you even started tooling. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and that just shows the confidence that customers have in us um, by producing. And I mean, I know there's a lot of stigma behind GoFundMe, which is why I don't, I don't subscribe to that that uh, ethos because it, it does have a lot of stigma and negativity behind it. So that's why we call it uh, an installment plan. Sure. Uh, but, it uh, is. but how did people get confidence in you if you'd only started in 2018? Like, are you just like you would go to these shows and you were just able to sell people and give people the, the people felt confident that you were going to make it. I mean, you had to yeah. start somewhere and they just, yeah. I mean, when, when we, uh, we, as I say, we launched in 2018. When we went back again the following year, we had the, the pre-production sample uh, of the GT3 on display. So we had the tooling sample. Um, so people had something physical to see at that point. So they like, great, they are actually making it. And, you know, we were taking orders on the day, uh, so much so that we got a, a message from our credit card company to say, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, transactions going on in the UK. Uh, what are you guys up to? <laughs> and we said uh we're at a show uh so open up the damn you know uh, pos machine because we're selling um and yeah uh, our our web web tech guy uh he actually had to um open up the bandwidth on the on the website because we'd crashed it twice in two days wow and and who's we uh well there's me uh as the main kind of head honcho Right, uh, and then I have my son, who uh, he deals with uh, a lot of um, customer inquiries. He deals with taking the details for uh, future models, for because you know we always get a lot of customers who submit ideas for new new ventures. You know, ones that haven't been made yet, typically because they've obviously figured out that's kind of our niche. And this is, um, this is your full time gig now, is it? Oh yeah, 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 totally time consuming. Oh yeah. yeah. Tony. And you and, and you kind of have to put that dedication in if you want the right model to come out looking, you know, as people would expect. And I wouldn't sell anything that I wouldn't prepare, would, I'm not prepared to have on my layout myself. Tony, you know what this reminds me of, if I may use a, may I use a hockey analogy? Well, I'll go right ahead, yeah. Yeah. You're, 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 even, you're, even though, even though your Maple Leafs didn't end absolutely. up I, well, but I don't want to bring that up. That's but, fine. That's fine. They're not expected to. They're, okay, that's true. Yeah. Uh, that's half the fun now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so you're looked upon in the league as the number one goaltender by many, many sources, by many, many experts. However, in one of the big crucial games of the year, a guy flips one in from center ice, it bounces a couple of times and goes right between your legs. This is kind of the way I feel with the way MRN had no idea that this existed. I knew we had no idea. We were the first ones, I believe, to have it in print. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. I oh, thought yeah. you. I thought you told me you didn't uh, know know of this guy. No, I had this in print and on the website, and yeah, no, we were what, right like there three, three years ago. Well, not for no, the UK no. stuff, no. But once the North American announcements hit, yeah. Okay, but okay. Cause, so cause I basically sent Tony an email, and he was he was all giddy because he he uh, he had this book coming out with the Shay on. It was like, wow, your timing's perfect. <laughs> oh yeah, kinda. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you knew nothing of it. You knew nothing of it before he he, he announced his Shay. No, right, I'm, uh, Keith. I'm talking mm-hmm. to Tony right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought it was my show. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so okay, so all right, let's get to this Shay. Let's get to this Shay. How how? So now you've made how many uh, British models had you made? 
so are you using like the same one of these same companies in China that everybody else uses, or do you have your? Have you been to China? Uh, I was planning to go before COVID struck. Okay. Uh, we were we were we were finalizing the assembly of the GT3, um, and we were uh, in the process of planning a trip and having it all, you know, kind of watching the last cases being loaded into the container, uh, and that was all kind of you know par for the course before COVID hit. So right, okay. kind of kind of put you know pay to that one. So how many how many models had you produced before you decided to try your hand at something in North America? One. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't know anything about this, Tony. You you didn't know you you bear this guy. This is very uh, fascinating. It is, and and how Keith did you come upon the decision for the Shea? I assume that wasn't like the first choice that there had to been some ideas and how. I mean, it's an awesome piece. I mean, it's a real attention getter, but. It's going to be what a class B two truck Shea, I believe, if I kind of know my stuff on that. And it's standard yeah. HO. It's not yep. an HO in three. This will be a standard nope. HO version first. Yep. Uh, and for those wondering too, like as this is a new company, you always get into the questions of, well, will it be DCC and will it be sound? And yes, if you look on the website, you'll see that the Shea is already being advertised with ESUs. Lock Sound 5 decoder in it as an option that there'll be a standard DC, there'll be a silent DCC, and then the DCC sound. So all the appropriate bells and whistles will be there. But tell us a little bit where, how did you get, how did the Shea become, hey, this is what we're going to, this is our splash into the market? Well, obviously, I mean, re- research plays a big part in, in any potential model that you bring out. So we, we actually got approached uh, by a, um, uh, one of our customers here in North America who has pretty much bought everything that we've put up for sale right now. And he said, have you thought about doing any North American stuff? I says, well, it hasn't been, you know, top of the agenda. I said, because, you know, we want to obviously get more successful in Europe and, you know, keep getting our feet wet kind of thing with, with various models. So he said, well, I really, really, really want a Shea. Well, at that point, I had never heard of a Shea. Um, so I said, oh, okay, well, let me do a bit of research. So I kind of went away. I found a museum in BC. Um, we had a run up there. British Columbia. Uh, British Columbia, yeah. for those who don't know what BC is. Yeah, on um, uh, on Vancouver Island there, uh, there's a museum called the BC Discovery Center. Uh, they have three shays uh, uh, on, dis- uh, on Ted, display. Time out. Ted Johnson, did uh, did you know any of, any of this, Ted, and you didn't hold, you were holding out on us? Carry on. He's a regular listener. He's a he's a true and true blue AMLer. So I just went, and he lives on Vancouver Island. So oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so in that case, then he'll he'll definitely know because it's up in Duncan, BC. Um, so yeah, we 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 went up there. We spoke to the curator. Got a whole bunch of drawings and designs, and took a whole thwack of pictures and uh, sent all the data we had to the factory. And well. The, the the cabs are, com- are complete and it's ready to go into tooling. The cabs, oh. but I thought tooling was like hundreds of thousands of dollars. It is. Okay, so are you taking orders on this? Not yet. Okay. No, nope. the expression of interest is open for that. Um, we're we're pretty close to getting um, where we can actually open the order book and people can start, uh, you know, uh, reserving their model. Are you going to go ahead with this model? Like, is the expression? Oh yeah. In- yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, the it's only been available on the expression of interest for I think three months now. Um, well, and how, uh, how are people even finding you? Like, it's like you kind of been flying under the radar. Well, that's what Sony's there for, right? The last couple of months, I mean, flying under the radar. He's had full page ads in a number of the White River okay. magazines, and that's I've had a lot of emails of people asking, you know, is this for real? Who is this? It's like, yep, yep. And I've signed up. I put in my expression well, of interest for well, okay. Shea. Well, okay, maybe he has had full page ads in many of the magazines, but we all know Tony. Yep. Tony, we all know uh, that you like to try to kind of keep me in the black so that you can, you know, <laughs> in the dark. So, uh, so okay. So you've been advertising this this Shea uh, full page ads in uh, in Model Railroad News, uh, Railroad Model Craftsman, anything else? Uh, yeah, Model Railroader. Okay. 
and a full page ad in my river. Yep. Wow. And how are you? How are you advertising it on it via the internet? Uh, obviously, the Facebook page that we have, and um, uh, we send out newsletters to people who have signed up on our page. Uh, we also um, are all over, you know, as I say, social media. So, yeah, I mean, the the I know the customer demographic that we have kind of isn't very um, uh, computer literate. So, Facebook is their first first port of call, hence the traditional uh you know magazine adverts right and which do you think you're getting the most feedback from right now oh definitely model craftsman i mean the the, the white river uh you know trio that we're we're advertising in right now is is uh has, has definitely been more fortuitous we think oh, this looking guy's... at the uh yeah looking at the uh feedback and emails that we've had from from people absolutely uh, this guy's pretty sharp immediately he goes white river <laughs> <laughs> you know some of these some of these people you have to coax say now yeah. what podcast do you listen to I don't know. It's yeah. Like again, you're on this podcast. What <laughs> podcast do you listen to? Yeah. Now, Keith, I noticed that like I've signed up on the Shea, and then there's four Freight Car America prototype. These are again North American cars. There's like a ballast car. There's yep. a two bay and a four bay center flow type car. There's an aggregate hopper, but there's also I know there's a logging. Now, of course, those would be brand new. You know, not necessarily in the same era with the Shea as far as compatible products, but you've got a log car that would be perfect. I don't see the log car on the website for the expression of interest because I did, I signed up for the Shea, but it, where's the log car to sign up for? Or is it just going into pre-order? Uh, no, the, the, the log car, the, the press release is actually penned in a, in a, uh, an email ready to go out, uh, along with, um, um, uh, the page going live at the beginning of uh, July. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then these other, the four freight cars, again, these are contemporary prototypes. So yeah. those folks listening, you think, oh, they're going to make freight cars to go with the Shea. No, the log car will be. But again, yeah. those four freight cars I talked to you about are basically something you'd see trackside today. That Freight Car America is a car builder of, you know, modern, again, center flows and the couple of hopper cars. And that's really interesting to see that, you know, these would be, you know, new, I guess, plastic freight car models from you guys of contemporary prototypes. Yes, because um, we, we felt that the the uh, attraction uh, for modern <laughs> era has been pretty much covered by everybody, uh, but that we, we still felt that there was uh, an opening for uh, modern era freight cars. Um, you, know, you know, there's a lot of people who do old box cars and um, petroleum cars, so we're kind of avoiding that, but grain cars... And uh, ballast cars, hopper cars, uh, you know, there's there's definitely a market for those. And we teamed up with um, uh, Freight Car America, who have been more than welcoming with, uh, you know, uh, giving us all their uh, data to actually produce these things in uh, accurate form. So, you know, there's going to be no discrepancies as, as far as accuracy goes. How did you get hooked up with Freight Car America? Phoned them up. I said, hey, we, we make model trains. Can I make yours? Do you not know the rules of... Uh, uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm not a kiss-ass. I just walk straight in. I don't care who you are. <laughs> you know, like seriously, I just, you know, if a, if a job needs doing, I just go out and do it. I guess what I'm trying to get at is I've been doing this podcast now seven years, and generally, not all... Has, ma- has it, wait, I'm sorry to interrupt, but has it been seven years? Yeah. Wow, it seems a lot longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just such a slow pitch right yeah. down the center i had to take the easy swing at it sorry well, you are, on your last show you want to make sure you get in all your shows. oh there you go um, there's, a, there's a low blow no oh. uh <laughs> so many man, many manufacturers are happy to answer questions but I've, but the american manufacturers give you this impression it's all very cloak and dagger. It's all very hush hush. It's all very difficult to do. And I guess the Keith, the thing I'm trying to get at is you have a very fresh, refreshing attitude about this whole thing where it's like, it's just not that big a deal if you're willing to put in the time. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. yeah I mean, if, uh, if, if, if you show the dedication that you want to produce something, then the customers feel that warmth because you can express it in a way that you you can sense the passion in in the in the projects that we do. 
and and we are very passionate about what we do. So you, how, so you just went to Freight Car America. Um, we you know we we take great pride in everything down to the packaging. Sorry, what? So you just went to Freight Car America and said, "Hey, we're building HO scale uh, cars, and uh, we'd like your plans." Yeah, basically. Yeah, that was that was about the crux of the of the. Yeah, just contacted their media guy and said, uh, uh, "You know, th- this is what we want to do, and uh, you know, can you put me in touch with someone who can help us?" He goes, "Yep, yeah, not a problem. Here's his here's his email address and his cell number." Then the next phone call was, "Hey, this is what we do. Uh, we'd like to we'd like to model your uh, your freight cars." Because they've got quite an extensive catalogue, really? so they're a one they're a one stop shop to go and, and model <laughs> modern freight cars. Uh, Tony, you have to move your mic out a little bit again. You're you've turned your nose and now it's blowing. Oh, on you. oh my gosh! Yeah, is that uh, better? Yeah. Um, this is fascinating. This is just I feel like there's a thousand questions and I don't know which di- direction to go down because. People don't just go to freight. This is what you don't understand. Maybe this is Keith. Maybe the problem is you. This is what you don't understand. People don't just go to Freight Car America and say, "Hey, we're building a whole bunch of HO scale uh, cars, so we'd like like your plans." Like you don't do that. Like, did you not well, know that you don't do that? Well, if if, if I did it off my own bat, um, and by mentioning Freight Car America in my my adverts. Uh, they would libel me and shut me down overnight. But the fact that it's there is proof that I am as good as my word. Sure. Tony, can you help me explain this to him? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, when you got, you know, when, I mean, we're English. We're not, we're not frightened of anybody. Um, <laughs> so at the end of the day, if I want something, I just, I don't care who you are. I will just approach you and say, this is what I need done. Can you help me? So how many is, how many projects do you have on the go right now then? Uh, well, we've got six in North America and we've got nine in the UK. And how many models have you actually produced at this point? At this point, delivered to customers one. <laughs> so you have fifteen models on the go and you've delivered one. Yes, <laughs> which I know I know in business terms that sounds like the most craziest thing you've ever heard. But as I say, it takes thirty months to produce one. You can't logistically, uh, in any in any business, produce one model, deliver it, and then start another one. Sure, you I, you you wouldn't last two minutes. Right, it's as simple as that. So, like like uh, you know, like I said, uh, the fell and the concept, and the, and the, we've actually got a second production run of the GT three in the UK. They will all be delivered this year. Yeah. Um. You, you, know, got a, you got a second production run of the GT3? Yeah, because when we closed the order book for the first for the first production run of the GT3, um, you know, word was getting around that, you know, hey, there's some, you know, strange UK guy that's making a GT3 model. It's like, oh, really? Like, you know, how come I've never heard of this? Well, we've been around for two years. Hello? Right. Um, so, you know, someone's obviously cracked their hearing aid up and actually heard what was going on. <laughs> um, so... We were then getting floods of emails saying, uh, how do I get a hold of one of these? I said, well, all the pre-orders have been sold because um, we don't carry stock. We don't have dead inventory. Um, so, you know, whatever goes into the warehouse is labeled and shipped the, pretty much the same day. Um, do you, so, do you, sell the, do you sell the retailers or strictly uh, just, no. to, just to the customer? Uh, we have no retail outlets in North America, and we only have three in the UK. Okay, and and it, and you prefer it that way, obviously. Well, yeah, because uh, I mean, uh, in, in this in this modern day uh, of e-commerce and buying everything online, um, it's far simpler to control your pricing, and uh, profits are obviously then plowed back into making future models, which is why we have so many projects in various stages of production. So you so you you close the book on the GT3, which is the uh, their, your first British uh, based yep. locomotive, and yep. and you said to the factory in China, okay, we want this many. Yep. Can you tell us how many this many was? Um, not really for the first one, no. Okay, <laughs> and Cl- then cl- closely guarded secret. Okay, uh, but le- but right. suffice it to say, for the second run. Uh, when I went back to them and said, um, hey, we need a second run of the GT3 and it's going to be more than the first one. They said, yeah, not a problem. We'll just dig the tools out again and re- remake it. Sounds like a plan. Have at it. So how did you find a company in China? Like, how did you just give me a little bit of that process? Because, 
you know, like uh, we know uh, uh, scale trains and rapido trains are both uh, try to have their own factories. So yep. how, do, how do you like uh, what? What is the? I mean, don't again, don't answer any questions you don't want to answer. But I mean, I know the listeners would be fascinated. I know the listeners are as fascinated as I am because I mean, this sounds all very uh, pie in the sky, and yet you've already produced a model. So I mean, it's like it's uh, all very fascinating. So like, seriously, how did you find a factory in China? Well, I mean, it, it, it's no different than uh, I mean, let's take. Let's take something simple. Let's say you wanted to, uh, to make a, a, a um, an odd shaped wrench for, for for a particular nut, right. right? So you would you would Google, you know, um, tool manufacturers, and a manufacturer would come up locally, and you would approach them and say, "Hey, I've got an idea for a, a, a strange looking wrench, but I, you know, I need some help making it. Can can you help me out?" And the guy there will go, "Yeah, sure, not a problem." It's like any other company, you pay them; they'll make whatever you want. Right. So, so turning it back to the, the, the train industry, um, 20 years ago, when pretty much, you know, North American trains were built in North America, European trains were all built in Europe, um, costs got that high that obviously things had to change. So the, the production moved east because uh, production costs were way cheaper. Because living expenses are cheaper. Everything's cheaper over there. Oh, I get that. But how do you go about finding somebody? Because it's not like, it's not like, like, how do you go about finding somebody that's going to produce a high quality model and, uh, and be able to somebody like, you don't just Google HO train uh, locomotive manufacturers. I don't, uh, that it can, it's got to be more complicated than that. It's a little more in depth than that, but that's, that's the basic synopsis. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you get samples off them. You find out, you know, who they've made for before, um, to a degree, obviously, because there's a, a lot of secrecy behind that. You know, all the customers, but yeah, um, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, um, the I mean, at the end of the day, there's still only a handful of of manufacturers that that will actually make model trains for a variety of companies, right? Okay. Um, you know, so basically, as I say, you 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 test the product. You say, okay, well. And and you know, it, it, it's it's not a it's not a um, a system where you give all your money up front and they disappear into the wilderness because they're on the other side of the world and you can't chase them. Right. It's they're they're paid as certain parts get built and they send you samples of where we're up to with that. And then if there's any any amendments that need doing, that all gets changed. Um, and there's this back and forth for probably six months to a year. Uh, depending on on if there's you know what what type of issue there is. So, um, so what is uh, your background? What what were you doing for? What was your background in li- like what how what did you do to make a living over the years? Did you have any kind of a background in manufacturing or model building or anything? Uh, I had an, I had my own company in the UK of um, uh, marketing and promotion. So mm-hmm. we we were used to approaching um, you know companies for various things, either sponsorship or. I mean, we, we worked with Commodore Computers for two years um, back in the 1990s. Um, and then my co, co-business partner uh, decided he wanted to take a different avenue. So we closed the company down and then I had to get a legitimate job after that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, as far as manufacturing background goes, um, none at all. It was a sharp learning curve. But, you know, the <laughs> proof is in the, in the models that we make. They are fabulous. Oh, absolutely! I've been looking at the pictures, and odd, oddly enough, Tony uh, still uh, puts out the uh, MRN using a Commodore sixty four. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those. Everybody had a Commodore sixty four. Um, okay, so let's get back to the Shea. So why why the ones on uh, Van- Vancouver Island? Like, there's uh, Shea. Do you know of Cass, West Virginia, where there's a whole museum and everything, and they have Shea? Oh, yeah. There? Yeah, I mean, we're 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 working on a on a project uh, which is going to be announced um, l- um, later on this year, around November, uh, which is actually going to be a, a cross continent uh, model because it was it was made in North America, but it actually ran in Europe. And there's a preserved version. Well, actually, there's a couple of pre- pre- preserved versions here in North America, and there's a couple in the UK. So that as a collaborative uh, venture. Um, 
you know, is is going to be an awesome project. So you might want to bring me back and, and pick my brains oh, over. Oh, you'll be well. back. Oh, you'll be back. Don't worry about <laughs> oh, that. You think? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You'll be back. <laughs> uh, because we're going to have a lot of questions. Key. We're going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, you found these shades on Vancouver Island, but you didn't answer my question. Uh, one of the well-known places in North America for shays and shays that run is Cass, West Virginia. Uh, did you have any, like, how did you decide which shay to make? Well, that's the problem with the shays is that they're all pretty much unique. There isn't, there isn't like a one-stop shay model because they're all, they're all different in various ways or different guises. They were pretty much built to order. Um, you know, there was a base model. So the, this one that we have is, is essentially, I mean, it's not based on the ones in, in, uh, in, in BC. They are, um, you know, pretty much a, a conglomeration of, of, of other models to actually just get one. I mean, it's, it's coming out in six different liveries and, you know, there is going to be fine details that don't quite match, you know, everything, but as a working Shea, it will look exactly that with all the drivetrain and the vertical pistons and uh, and everything so yeah i mean it's it's going to run that way and we've 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 you know um we've been working hard on the uh, on the logistics of getting all the the mechanics of it working um so that it doesn't bind and and snarl up and everything with it being yeah how's that go how's that going i mean that must be this company that you're using are they kind of like tearing their hair out trying to get this thing to work uh, no, actually, their 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 designers are, are are really good because we've uh we we've pushed a lot of of new buttons for them that they've actually had to um really develop and really re-engineer um you know certain certain stereotypes when you're making a model like how how much will this model actually do? So we're making we we we, we launched a um, an expression of interest for a freight car in the UK that's going to be DCC operated. Well, that is an unheard of um, thing in the modeling industry because I, I, I think personally that the, 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 the capabilities of DCC are far underutilized. There's far more potential with, with running DCC on your, on your layout than just, you know, sound lights, motion uh, or, or anything else. So uh, why not have a freight car that actually works, that actually does something? Well, what is this freight car going to do? So hey, it's a, it, it's you notice, a, it's the, hang on, hang on. You notice Tony, he's trying to get, steer us away from the Shay talk. <laughs> now, no, no. Now he's, no, got, no. now he's got us on a freight car that's going to do something. That's going to, I hadn't, yeah, heard, so, I hadn't heard of this. This is not the ore car. This is a different no, car. Yeah. This, this is the, it, it's, it's called a molten ore wagon. It's designed to transport molten iron ore. Uh, so the 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 barrel of the of the iron ore when it when it tips out the liquid is going to rotate 180 degrees oh, under, DC, under DCC power. And that's that's so, a cool idea. That's very yeah. good. Yeah, I don't think anybody's. We've had some sound freight cars, but as far as something doing something, that is interesting. Yeah. yeah so when so when we when we looked at the engineering for the Shea, the original engineering was uh, each of the uh, sorry the the rear. Uh, um, truck on the on the on the dual truck Shea uh, was the one that's going to that was going to be powered, and I said, well, what about all the drivetrain? You know, all the drive shafts. Um, I sa- he said, oh no, he said that they- they'll not uh, they'll move. He said, but there'll be no kind of you know power behind it. So I said, well, can't we gear it somehow? We we had this back and forth for pr- probably two or three months to actually get the engineering to work, and. Yeah, the the motor's now being completely repositioned. It's going to be in the chassis of the of the Shea, and the Shea has got all gearing now to actually run the the drivetrain as as it would if it was a real Shea. Hmm. That's like a Swiss watch. Swiss watch. If you nearly said that, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get it. You keep di- so okay. So now we're back to the gearing. Is this is going to be as fine a quality as a brass Shea from Tenchado forty or fifty years ago? I mean, there was nothing cooler than a Shea watching a Shea go down the tracks with all the and that. So the motor is actually the gearing is actually what's going to drive, yeah, dr- drive the Shea. Yes, uh, yeah, and we and we will we will have a video 
uh, of our first sample running on YouTube as soon as we have it. And when do any idea when that might be? Uh, tooling's underway now uh, for the for the Shea. That should we should have the sample kind of mid year. Mid, it's a mid, mid yeah, kind of mid year kind of of 2021 or 2022. Oh no, th- this year set be September October time. We should you know mid mid, mid to you know sometime heading towards into, into fall. So you have a YouTube channel too, do you? Oh yeah, yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Keith, but I've never heard of you before. So while you're going, oh yeah, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, and I'm also going, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I can hear your eyes rolling <laughs> so uh how did you decide on so your uh your uh european your british stuff it, it comes dcc equipped too i'm assuming yep yep dc dcc fitted and dcc sound and which of those three is the most popular to sell um right now actually it's it's there's not a lot of difference between the uh, DC and the uh, uh, DCC sound. You're still, um, you're still selling a lot of DC locomotives. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That's something people don't realize. It's uh, like uh, Jim Scores of NCE always told me he he still thinks that like fifty percent of the population is still using DC. Yeah, that would be a fair estimate because I mean it it it. it if people have got existing layouts, it, it's a it's a harder job to convert it to DCC ready to actually run your existing stock, and then you've got to convert all your old stock to to run on DCC. So most people don't tend to bother. Oh, I just totally disagree. Uh, there was a guy that used to have a column in Model Railroad back in the late nineties and early two thousands, and he uh, way back when twenty. 20- 22 years ago he decided to convert his layout to dcc from dc and it was like uh it was like rewiring the layout and you took out tons and tons of wire it was incredibly it was incredibly satisfying it was much more uh much more user friendly once it was done and it was not that big of a job oh yeah i mean you know if if, if you've got that level of dedication to do it have at it but um you know if, if when you're dealing with you know i mean some of my models are 30 plus years old um and uh, you know w- would never entertain a dcc chip but um i i have uh you know um chip one of them for for a start you know uh tony where are you falling on that the whole thing i mean you you're you get your ear to the you have your your finger on the pulse of the hobby what is uh where do you fit in on that i think there's more of a market for standard dc than is always thought and when i ask manufacturers about it I always hear, oh, no, we don't produce nearly the same number of regular DC as we do DCC. The DCC is by far the big seller. But then whenever I look as stuff comes out, those DC models are always the ones that are instantly sold out. But then I get told, we don't make that many of them. So it's like, well, wait a minute. It's like maybe that's chasing its tail there. It's like, why is there they're sold out, but you don't make them because they don't sell? Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. And, you know, I I'm really more a collector than an operator so for me it's doesn't matter that there's certain things i do buy dcc and sound because i want to you know hear it and see what it does but i'm just as happy with it being a straight dc model because like well i'm really not going to run it that much anyway right okay so uh so how did you decide so do all your uh european models are they all uh low sound as well uh, yes, we we have a um, an agreement with um, uh, ESU to to supply um, Lock Sound Five uh, sound decoders. And uh, why did you decide on ESU? What was there? What was the determining factor for that? Pure quality, to be honest. Right, because you. Uh, yeah, because I've I, I've got existing models with Lock Sound chips in, and I thought, yeah, why not? So I reached out to them and said, hey, can you supply us with Lock Sound chips? Yep, if you pay us. Lock sound chips. You mean decoders? Yeah, decoders. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you even entertain the fact of soundtracks or some of the other? What some? What are two of the other? There's two, um, uh, TS TCS. Is it TCS? Yeah, we we approached TCS and I never got an email back. So okay. Um, you're kind of so a, you're kind of a straight shooter, aren't you? Oh yeah. 
Yeah, no, amb- <laughs> no ambiguity with me. Trust me. Yeah. Um, so basically, you just get you just get one shot at the pot, and if you miss it, well, sorry, I will move on. Uh, <laughs> to- Tony, I just had a thought. What about if yeah. I took Keith on the dude show? Oh I my think, goodness! I think the dude's head would explode. Yeah, probably in a lot of the <laughs> a lot of the people that view the show. Yeah, it's it, it is it, it's an it's an interesting approach that he's taken, and seems to be working. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean when, you, when you hear it, when you hear the stuff, well, I Googled this or I went to this, you know, Freight Car America or I said, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, that would be the, well, this is how we're going to do it. And then you find out, no, you can't really do that. Or here's how that works. Or no, this is what you're going to run into. And yet he's got models that he's done. But yeah, just. Yeah. Like, it's going to be so much fun, Keith, uh, talking to you as you go along here, because. Uh, you know, you're just at the very beginning of it. You've produced one model and you got 14 others. And, and so who, which is the closest thing to coming out next? Um, the fell is, uh, is heading into uh, final production, uh, next month and will be delivered, um, uh, mid fall. So where are they delivered to? Are they delivered to you in Edmonton or are they delivered to no. So We have a, we have a fulfillment warehouse in the UK for distribution around, uh, Europe and uh, and the rest of the world. Okay. So the so the container gets loaded in China, shipped to the UK, it's unpacked, labeled, shipped, done. So you're just like you're completely detached from this whole thing. Like you you'll get a couple, you come your way, but basically yep. it's all just uh it mess it's all just emails and messages for you. Basically, yeah, yeah. Keep it simple. Don't don't complicate something that's simple. <laughs> <laughs> so have you got? So have you even got to the point of figuring out where you'll uh, be shipping your American stuff from? Uh, yeah, we have a fulfillment warehouse already lined up in Colorado. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to do the, uh, all the necessary distribution because, I mean, why would we ship it from Canada? We've got all the uh, uh, customs issues. If it's going to come through a port, might as well land it in Los Angeles, truck it to um, uh, to, to Denver, and let them stick uh, stamps and labels on. Right. It. And would this uh, distribution warehouse be anywhere near anywhere near Intermountain Models? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I I wouldn't know. All right. Well, how do you find an how do you find a distribution warehouse? Google. <laughs> <laughs> because you know nothing of us, clearly uh, Google's not your best friend. <laughs> I I live on Google. Okay. Uh, but well, no, I mean you yeah. just just Google fulfillment warehouse US. Okay. You'd be surprised how many come up. All right, and uh, no, but you're very. Do you? Uh, you should check out uh, um, Midwest Model Railroad. Uh, he's an in Independence, Missouri. He's very much like you. He's just a guy that makes it happen, and he has turned a four hundred or three hundred square foot little business in his uh, mom and dad's basement into a what is it now? Twelve thousand square feet. I think so, and expanding again. No, it's nine going to. Oh, nine, but yes, yeah, going to the next. Yeah, I think it's twelve or uh, twelve or thirteen or fourteen. And he and he is ta- in ten years. He has gone completely against the stream because everybody says, "Oh my God, we're losing brick and mortar shops," and he has got probably one of the best in the country now, and just yeah. very very similar to to the way you're doing things. You just just do it, man. Just do it. Yeah. You know, don't don't waste any time. Just get on with it and do it. Knuckle down. Have at it. We can't blow by this Shay, though. I notice you keep trying to get us off this <laughs> Shay. Because uh, do you not understand the, uh, to me anyways, uh, to me, Tony, uh, to me, building a Shay in HO scale that would be of quality, that would run well, is in the H- world of model railroading, HO scale model railroading, it's kind of like mind-blowing. I mean, that's, that's a, that would not be my first choice just out of fear of, wow, let's do like, you know, a little industrial switcher, like two axle block type thing, and then see if we can make it happen. I mean, yeah, to do the Shea is like, I think I'm going to take up mountain climbing. Let's head to Everest. Like, really? That's the first one you want to do? Yeah. Like, like, that's the thing, Keith. Like, how did you guys decide on a Shea? I mean, with all those gears and and all the gearing and uh, drivetrain and everything like that, did it not at any point kind of, did you stand there while you were in British Columbia on Vancouver Island looking at the thing? Did you kind of not scratch your head and go, 
hmm, this seems pretty complicated. Yeah, and then, then I kind of took a step back and go, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> and on, on your, I assume, you know, you've not, you haven't really said, I've seen before we started on the podcast, you showed me a handful of the models. So I assume that you are pleased with what you're getting, you know, again, because this is a Hold new on, situation. Here. I mean, tell, <laughs> tell me. Wait a minute, like, time out, time out. What do you mean you get to see a handful of the models? Well, you know, because I logged on early, I assume that you were still watching the end of Little House on the Prairie. I'd already seen that episode. So I went ahead and just turned it off. And I thought, well, let's see if Keith is online yet. And I, you know, got there about five, ten minutes ahead of you. And he showed me some of the models. So, yep. again, these are I, I can't imagine the excitement of starting a company, having something made in China. And then when it shows up. This, you know, has to be mind blowing to open. the. I mean, you've seen pre-production, you have an idea, you know, you know, generally, but to really see here's the finished product. I mean, what was that like? That had to be a wow. I, you know, it it happened. Yeah, I did it, you know. Yeah, it's it, it, it is a surreal. Um, it is a surreal experience to, to kind of, you know, because it takes so long to, to, to go from an idea to a finished product to actually have that that first sample come. And to be honest, the most surreal part about it was when you see the first bunch of packaging with the company name on hmm. that is that is just like wow we've done this and and the skepticism that we had initially when we first launched was yeah, yeah really you're pie in the sky you know we, you're not going to do this <laughs> and 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 then obviously you know as as time has progressed and we and you know we do keep people informed as to progress you know with cad drawings and uh, uh sample pictures and videos and you know so we keep keep that information stream going you know to keep people enthused um about where we're at and and, and the developments of it so you know when obviously when we get the first sample of of the shade then obviously you know tony and 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 um uh his other colleagues at his other the other publications on white river they'll, they'll also get uh you know fully informed of it and and uh, Lionel, I might even cut you in on the deal. No, oh, wouldn't that be swell? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's it is it is a very surreal feeling to actually see something that you've worked so hard over to 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 get it to to fruition, and it, it's it's a it's a beautiful feeling. It really is. This is going to come out completely wrong. I know this is going to come out completely wrong, and Tony, you're going to have to cover me on this. Okay. Uh, but okay, for your first North American model, you're building. A two truck Shea, which mm -hmm. has only ever been attempted twice before, and I wouldn't say either one of them was a roaring success. And I and I kind of imagine, I'm imagining this if this runs like uh, the very first uh, Cato powered Atlas models. I can remember when I bought one of those for the very first time back in the '80s and ran that. I was like, oh my god, this is runs unbelievable compared to anything I'd had up to that point. And if this Shea runs like that. I mean, so my my point I was going to make is like, aren't you kind of blowing the top off of everything and making it go like, well, guys, this isn't nearly as difficult as everybody's been. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, 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 there there are challenges to it. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It, it uh, I, I don't want to come across as complacent that that this is anything you know other than difficult. But no, I mean, it, it's. Uh, you know, we we will be sticklers to the detail and the engineering and the quality and and everything before we even even offer it to any any customer uh, or for that matter any any magazine for review. We're not going to send them a, a broken model to to to, to you know to. I understand that. With. But yeah, I mean, you know, there is exhaustive testing that that's done before you know we we go any further with it. And if there is any issues, they all get eradicated before uh, you know before we go into assembly and production. All right, so I got to so, I got to come up with some better questions because I'm fascinated that in just three short years you have 15 models in production. One of them is going to be a is going to be a Shea and HO scale. You've already made contact with America or Freight Car America. They're sending you your plans. I mean, obviously you're a guy that likes to get things done, but somewhere along the way. Like, did you just wake up bolt upright one night in 2018 and go, you know what? I'm going to start a, a, a model train company that's just going to surpass so many others. Like, like, how did you get to this point? Um, that, yeah, that is a difficult question. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it just started as just a GT3. That was all we wanted to do initially. 
was, you know, yeah, we'll just bring this, you know, we'll just bring the GT3 to to fruition and 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 we'll we'll go from there. And then 2019 came along, we did the same show again. Uh we had a um an EP sample uh of of the GT3 that arrived actually on the Thursday as we opened on the show on the Friday. What's an e- so what's was, an e- what's an EP sample? Uh engineering prototype. Okay. Um <clears throat> so so we, 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 we had two of those at the show for people to pour over and, and, and look at. Uh, and they were riddled with errors. Um, because as I say, they, they'd literally just, you know, just been delivered from China. To, so, you know, but it, it, it just proved to everybody that we could do what we were doing. And then during the show, believe it or not, somebody came up to us with a USB stick with plans on for the fell. It was like, Oh my God. And it, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since. <laughs> it's just it's just been nuts it's you know you you, you could i mean we, we we've got endorsements from uh two uk manufacturers of of actual uh locomotives who have provided us with uh details of two other models that we're already making so yeah i mean the we, we just seem to have embraced the whole industry with with open arms and people have have, have hugged us back it's been it has been a real surreal three years to be honest and it's 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 showing no sign of letting up either. Tony, you really uh, you smacked this one out of the park, buddy. Isn't I mean it's it, you lost yeah. your words, aren't you? Yeah. I am. I am. <laughs> I literally am. I am at a loss for words, and that's kind of half the fun because I don't want to let this. Yes, you will be back on because it'll be fun to constantly check in with you to hear what you're doing. But uh, people who listen to this podcast uh, are going to be fascinated to hear about how how you got from a to z and like i said i mean did you just wake up both like there must be uh like okay let me put it to you bluntly people have known occasionally tony i'm kind of blunt on the show am i not that would be true yes yeah, yeah. occasionally just to get to the point just to get yeah. to the, ask the questions that people are do you just have pockets full of cash and you're just like this start <laughs> This started out as a hobby, and <laughs> and the fact that there was hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tooling that had to be done really wasn't that big of a deal for you because you kind of were carrying that around as change in your pocket, or what? Uh, no, and I've got no rich relatives. Um, you know, I I didn't win the lottery, um, nothing like that. It's just all guts and determination to see this thing through from start to finish. I mean, it's just. It is a labour of love, and it has become a, a, an absolute passion. As my partner will, 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 you know, you know, detest because you know I am permanently on my phone, uh, answering emails from the factory because obviously the time time difference, uh, dealing with customers at four o'clock in the morning who have no idea what the what the time difference is in Canada. Um, so you know, it, it's it's just it is it is a labour of love, and and we have great customer feedback. Uh, you know, uh, guys will send you an email saying, "Hey, you just released something else. I've got to get a part-time job." Um, you know that kind of thing. It, it's it's you know it's just awesome that the some of the comments that we get back. Uh, okay, your partner. You have a partner in the business, or no, 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 a life partner. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did they lose yeah. a bet? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> she, she, uh, she's she's definitely the the, the the calm in my chaos. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> She she is the voice of sensibility. So what did she say? <laughs> what, she, what did she say when you started uh, giving her these ideas? Because you, you've got a you know it's not like okay I started the podcast, but I started the podcast because you know I thought oh this will be a fun thing to do, and it wasn't a whole lot of yeah. There's some work involved, and it's fun to keep up with it and do it. But this seems like is this just a natural? Is this is this just seem to have come naturally to you? Uh, I mean, like I said before, that that you know that there is a sharp learning curve to the whole process of how it all works. But um, I wouldn't say it came naturally. It, it, it there has been some some behind the scenes logistical challenges, um, you know, with obviously setting up an e commerce you know company and you know all the permits and regi- registrations that you've got to go through to to make yourself legitimate. Um, but you know, at the end of the day. Um, you know, we, we've we've got um, you know a great following. We're a, we're an established company now. Um, I guess that's you know, where that's what I'm confused about is because, uh, I mean, in a very short period of time, like how do you figure? Okay, so you take ads out in in magazines, but like you've got a following, and how do people find you? Like how how has it been? That is it just because you went? Was it that you went to the 
uh, the Wally Show or War yeah. Warbly if if Warby Show is it Warbly or W A Wally. W A R L E Y Wally Warly okay yeah Warly Warly yeah uh, um uh, Peter Borchich has been there uh, do you know has Peter Borchich reached out to you he's from uh, he's from he lives in in England he I think he's the neighbor to the Queen or um, <laughs> uh, did you know that did you know that the president of the NMRA now is from Scotland. Oh really? Yeah. See that, oh, that, that Tony. This is this is I Keith. Know that. Keith, this mm-hmm. is you are going to be part of this podcast for years to come because the point I'm trying to make here is I've been making. I'm sure you've listened to every episode and some of them twice. But uh, the point I've made al- all along. This is a good question for you. The point I've made all along about this podcast. The thing that I've discovered more than anything else is that this hobby is way bigger than anybody realizes. Oh, it is. It's huge. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely enormous. Yeah, yeah. Like, is is that part? Has that part surprised you? Like the the enormity of uh, the number of people that have reached out to you and the number of contacts and how well the thing has taken off. Like, has that surprised you? Absolutely, it has that that and the and the and the passion that a lot of our customers have, uh, not only towards our pro uh, projects, but uh, ju- just generally some of the you know observations that they make. Um, you know. I mean, we, we we christen them rivet counters in the UK because they count the rivets on the panels and tell you that there's one missing. Um, <clears throat> but but yeah, I mean, the the, the, the they are fanatical. It, it it goes beyond passion. Um, and and you know, obviously, you know, I, I've I've had emails now from from you know customers here in North America with regards to the Shea, and they're super excited to say that you know we're actually bringing this thing out after such a long time of not having a decent one. So, you know, um, that being said, you know, we, we clearly, you know, have to get it right. I don't think there's ever been a Shea made in plastic that was decent. I mean, I know two companies tried, but I don't think there's ever been one that's like, I just imagine this thing's going to run like a Swiss watch. Uh, yeah, we hope so. Yeah, we, we will certainly, um, that, that is definitely our aim. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I have a customer in Georgia who, who has bought everything that, that, or, or pre-ordered everything that we've we've released so far just for the UK market. And when I told him, uh, you know, that we were bringing the Shea out, I think he nearly passed out. But you know, <laughs> um, he's a he's he's a lovely guy. He, he he emails me regularly, messages me on Facebook or whatever, and just says, "Hey, I saw you doing such and such. You know, can't wait for it to arrive. You know, me GT3 arrived last month. Fantastic job. You know, really love it. Great. You know." So the GT so, so the GT3 has been released then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was delivered. Um, All right, now time uh, time out. Didn't or Tony? Didn't earlier we ask, and he said the only thing that's been made is what's the wagons. Well, no, the oh. he's got the one locomotive, the GT GT three electric, and there's a second run of it coming. All right, and then the fell that double ended locomotive, but then the ore wagons, you know, rolling stock. So how together. many locomo? How many pieces have actually been made and delivered to? Individ- different models have been made and delivered to customers. One, the GT3. He just said it again. One. Yeah, one. So those hopper cars don't exist then? Uh, yeah, they they're they're actually in in a, in a production and assembly now. They they'll be delivered. They're they're due to be shipped um, in about two months. Okay, so uh, there's a picture of one of them in a completed form. So they've sent yep. you, they sent you a completed one then. Yep, yep. I, if um, yeah, I can I can send you a picture of one of that now. I have. Well, I, I already have, looked at it on your website. Yeah, I've got four in my is office this, right now. Is this a bit? Did somebody send you here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. T- t- Tony paid me to turn up. <laughs> he, he said you've got an evening free. He said, C- let, just let, let's go rip into Lionel for an afternoon. Yeah, go wind up Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the evil overlord. Uh, so okay, so now so. The GT3 has been delivered to the customers. The yep. wagons, what are they called? The wagons? Consit or wagon. Consit or the or wagon. It is yep. now you have to have received some samples of it. And, yep. the f- and and when will it arrive? When will that container arrive in the distribution center? Uh we should be should be finishing assembly in the next couple of weeks, loaded onto the container by the end of next month and uh, assuming it doesn't get stuck in the Suez Canal like the last one, um, then um, yeah, it should be uh, should be in customers' hands late summer. 
How did it? How did the last one end up in a sewage canal? No, Suez Canal. <laughs> you can say the shit that got stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> he walked right into that one. He walked yeah, right pumped. into that one. Yeah. Well, it's rare for you to have someone with an accent. We're usually picking on your accent, Lionel. So <laughs> no, only you pick on my accent. Oh. Well, okay, Keith, where if you had a house and you had a smaller <laughs> building next to it that you parked your automobile in, what would you call that? A uh, garage? Oh, he said garage. Well, See? yeah. That's what yeah. what else would he call it? A uh, garage. Uh, garage. Uh, it's a garage. Uh, oh, it's a garage. Uh, Keith. Uh. Keith. Uh-huh. When you're uh, when you take an undecorated model and you paint it, and then you want to letter it for whatever railroad you're going to uh, uh, letter it for, what do you what do you what do you put on it? What what is the what are those what, decals? Ah, well, it's not it's decal. No oh, decals. Oh. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Now okay. I, now I don't think he is brilliant. But we're one for one there. He yeah. went with he <laughs> went with the mispronunciation of garage, but he did say decals <laughs> properly. Not uh, decals, decal. Uh, do you have a hockey stick in your house? God no. <laughs> <laughs> what is that strange sport that they do? Yeah, oh yeah. lord! I know uh, I don't follow soccer before anybody says anything either. Uh, so let's get back to this Shea. You're blowing way past this Shea too easily because this is <laughs> this is huge news. I mean, not everybody's going to want one. I think I'll probably end up buying one because it's just going to be if it's as cool. If it ends up. Here's your challenge. If it ends up running like a Swiss watch, I'm all over buying one of those. Only one? With, well, with, your, buy- fi- with your finances, you can buy all six. <laughs> all six. Well, are they going to be different uh, lettered? Are you going to sell undecorated or unlettered ones? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Plain right. black. Plain black. Yeah. All right, I'll buy one of those. Put me. How do I, how do I fill out the I'm, I'm interested thing? Walk me. Let's walk through this. I'm in. Uh, this is. This is bizarre expression of interest. I've never heard of that ever. No, and, the, and this is confusing a lot of uh, North American customers because it, it's, it's an unheard, unheard of concept. Yes. And and why, of course, would you not do something? Un, un... So, okay, so I'm looking at it now. The Shea locomotive was most widely used geared steam locomotive. Locomotives were built to uh, patents of Ephraim Shea. Uh, this is a Class B, three cylinders, two trucks. 10 to 60 short tons. What does that mean? Eight. Uh, it's, uh, let's see. Our rendition of the Shea will feature ESU Loke Sound V5 sound decoder, cast chassis. So it's going to be cast out of metal somehow. Yep. Working external valve gear and drive shafts. Working directional lamps front and rear. DCC ready 299, which is D and uh, DCC fitted. Through. I'm going to get the DCC sound. So what do I got to do now? So. Uh, where you see the where it says the shade double O, uh, so uh, H O gauge expression of interest. Right. There's a short form there that uh, you just need your email address, first and last name, phone number if you want to put it in, and what country you're in. Okay. All right. All right. I'll put in my name, Neil Erickson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And then what happens after that? And then after that, um, um, as the progress uh, of the uh, project uh, proceeds. You will get an updated newsletter uh, with <clears throat> um, kind of you know delivery time schedules and a notification when to pre-order and uh, all that all that wonderful stuff to keep you up to speed with uh, you know with with how the project is is progressing. Okay, so what happens is people uh, express interest. Yep, an expression, and then uh, they don't pay anything. They just put their name Correct. in, and then uh, after that. They uh, get to, you'll send them updates about what's happening. And then when it's time, and when do you, how do you, de- when do you determine it's time for people to pony up some dough? Uh, typically when we have, um, you know, more than enough to, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of break even on the project. So, I mean, obviously there's a, you know, there's a, um, a cost involved in producing these things. So we, we have a, a magic target number of, of, you know, potential customers that we have to hit. Uh, so when we do o- o- open the order book, th- those people will cover the costs of the locomotive. So, so then you say, okay, it's time to pay up, and yep. and people start paying. Well, what happens if not enough people pay at that point? Do you refund them the money? Do you just keep going? Like, what what happens? Yeah, I mean, we 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 had a project um, 
a couple of years ago that we couldn't actually finish the project on uh, because of, of technical constraints. And uh, we refunded everybody that had pay, uh, paid their initial deposit. Okay. And what's the easy uh, installment plan? So we here, uh, so here at the, the uh, AML Network, we have uh, two. You can also have the free uh, podcast, which is this is, so that you can get the most bang for your buck. But on, uh, then we also have four other podcasts, uh, weekly podcasts, where uh, you, you you join Patreon and you can pay either five or ten dollars, <coughs> depending on whether you want a T-shirt. So we have uh, for uh, three hundred and sixty-five easy uh, payments of sixteen cents. You can be part of the. Uh, you can get the other podcasts. How many payments do you guys have? Um, that ranges anywhere between uh, three to five, dependent on the cost of your of your model. So obviously the you know with the, the ready ones um, cheaper than the uh, than the sound one. Uh, but uh, payments typically, I mean, it's, it's fifty bucks down, and then payments are average around sixty sixty five dollars every every other every second month. All right. So we, and it's and it's zero uh, percent interest. We don't charge interest for it. It's just a simple payment plan. It's automatic. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, do, uh, am I late for the next payment? Right. Nope, because that's all in the agreement that you will receive an email on uh, once you, uh, you know, sign up for the installment plan. So eventually now that I've sent, I said that I was interested, eventually now I'm going to get an email that says, okay, we're far enough. So how far, so how do you determine, like, what is the point in the production of the model where you start charging people money? Uh, typically when we have something to show, I mean, right now, yes, we have completed, um, you know, completed CAD drawings and we're into tooling. Uh, so we're committed with the factory to do this primarily on the, on the strength of feeling that we've had so far with the expression of interest. So, so this project is definitely 100% going ahead. There's no turning back now. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are that, we are that confident with it. Okay. And all right, so how did, who, how did you teach yourself to do CAD drawings and all that? Like, how do you, how do you? We have keep, a designer. You have a designer, of course you do. Yeah. And his yeah. name is Steve. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or, or Fred or Simon, whatever he decides to call himself that particular week. So where is this? So what? Is, don't tell me. Let me guess. You Googled model uh, model train locomotive designers. No, actually, he's attached to the factory, but that's another story. <laughs> <clears throat> so. So you don't have a designer; they have a designer. We we have we have a um, um, you know a contacts that we use uh, on a on a commission basis that do do some of the basic stuff, but the the actual um, uh, models are all designed uh, in house in the factory. Come on, you guys! This is some sort of a gag, right? You guys set you guys <laughs> set this up. <laughs> nope, no gag. This is genuine. <laughs> Um, I, can, I can I can sell you a T-shirt with KR models on it if you really. All want right, okay. I should send you one of mine, and you could send me one of yours. Mm. Uh, <coughs> were you going to say something, Tony? What uh, road names on the Shea? Do you have? Do you know? Like you talked about, there'd be like the finished and unlettered. Uh, when will we get to the point of road numbers or road names and some of those that information? Yeah, I mean that that will be in in one of the first emails that we'll send out to. Uh, you know, to people um, who have expressed an interest. So, Lionel, you'll be able to see that when that comes up. The artwork is is penned and ready. <clears throat> uh, we just have to send it out, basically. So, how do you decide which road names? Um, it, well, I mean, we uh, did the time out. I I know, Tony. I know how he figured out. It. He Googled guy that decides <laughs> road names for H <laughs> scale locomotive. There's nothing Go like ahead. that. There's not. No, no. I don't think you can Google that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how how do you determine the road names? Well, we did the research on on kind of what was, um, you know, what what rail companies actually used them. So like Westside Lumber for a start, they right. used one. Uh, you know, um, uh, obviously Canadian Pacific had one. So we, we, we you know we're spanning both sides of the border there. Um, Southwestern Portland Cement, that's another one. Um, and obviously the plain black one, and then there's a few others. But yeah, th those that's penned ready for a newsletter to go out. Uh, you know, very soon. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 all par for the selling process of of keeping keeping the information stream going with with information on on the project. So when the order book opens, people have got the information there in front of them as to okay, which, which livery do I want? I hope this runs really well because if it does, I'm buying a couple of them. <laughs> 
I'm, and, I'm putting, and, you, down. And, I'm putting and, you down for all six. No, and I, mean, I, I just want the un- I want the unlettered, the undecorated ones. So they're painted and ready to go. But I'm buying it. I'll buy a couple of them if they run as good as you say they're gonna. And and well, I can I can tell that through all this questioning, you're frustrated, Lionel. That at no point has Keith said, "Oh, I don't know. We never thought about that." Because you thought for sure <laughs> with that, you know, I, the knock on the door and, uh, sir, Mike Wallace is here from CBS. Oh, oh, you know, well, that this was you thought you were going to catch this guy in some. And look at this. He's got a plan. You know, it's I've not heard anything that makes me think, oh, OK, wait a minute. Red flags. It's like, eh, sounds good to me. Well, this is a good this is an excellent question for you, Tony. I mean, you've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of model railroad manufacturers what is your impression of of uh keith and and kr models and like uh is it kr yeah it's kr models and what is your impression of this is it is this were you caught off guard are you like wow is this guy for real like where did you where do you fall in i had the wow is this for real at first till i saw some of the double o samples and things to know like okay yeah this all sounds really good but is there anything that you know tangible here and when i saw that he had done some things that the biggest thing i would say is like his tagline is they dare to make models that others don't and i probably have not said that right keith but i see also his whole business approach is very innovative and unique that again it's not that typical and and I like it because you almost feel like as the buyer or the hobbyist, you're more partnered in the process. You know, the expression of interest and the putting the installment thing down as it's coming along that somehow I feel more vested in it somehow, like that this is a project, you know, even though I'm involved in it to the point that I'll give you my visa number. But, you know, I'm not having to really do anything. But you know what I'm saying? That there's yeah. something more to it that it, it's it's a, there's there's a fun thing to it to know, hey, this is a project that's coming together. You know, I'm in on the ground floor. I signed up for it and I'm waiting to hear more about it. And it'll be one of the first people to get them because we hear about stuff all the time and you can buy it everywhere. And that's great and wonderful. But is there something kind of innovative and unique to this approach that also is kind of enticing? Like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. I want to get something like that. But that's a neat neat process yeah i think our, our best-selling technique is word of mouth yeah and because, I, under, I understand you know, that but i up until two weeks ago i'd never even heard of you well no but i mean with a with the best kept secret in north america um you know we 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 have approached the way that we sell models completely different to everybody else because i i felt that it was time for a refresher i i i wanted to to, to have um a connection with the manufacturers that I was buying my products from, and I wasn't getting that. You know, you don't you don't have a a, a half decent customer service. There's nobody you can talk to. Everything's automated. There's a robot for this, and you know, an automated system for that. And it's no, no. I need to talk to a living person, and you know, that's why you know um, I cover the North American side and this time uh, this time uh, uh, zone. And my son's in the UK, and he deals with all the stuff and you know, uh, the UK and their time zone. So we, we cover both ends of the spectrum, and, and you know that, that's why we've built up such a great following, because people have embraced us, because we have literally blown a breath of fresh air onto, the, onto a stagnating industry that was basically complacent with digging out a 30-year-old Thule because, oh, we've not built it for a few years. Let's dig it out again. Let's make some more. Mm-hmm. No, we've got to refresh this. Come on. Really? So we have actually set new standards by the quality of, of, of model that we're producing. And I won't settle for anything that's, that's you know, I'm not happy with having on my own layout. So you're going to produce in plastic a Shea locomotive that's going to run probably as well as anything out there. You're not convinced, are you, Lionel? No, I'm, <laughs> no to be you, completely you are, you are. You are so skeptical that we can't pull this off. Uh, yeah, you know what? You seem like a really good guy. Like the couple of times we've talked uh, to to, like I talked to you briefly just to check your audio, and I, uh, Tony, uh, uh, didn't I say to you this is going to be a great conversation? Mm-hmm. Because he's very. Or I did. I said he's a very forthright guy, and so I'll be forthright right back. And I'm like. Right at this moment, I am skeptical. I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful because you sound like you're 
and it looks like you got your stuff together. So I'm very hopeful. But yeah, right, probably right at this exact moment, I'm kind of skeptical because it seems like a pretty big nut to break, you know. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, everyone said that when we brought out the GT3. You know, when we announced that back in 2018, oh, you, you can't do this. The, you know, you, because the typical way of, of, of producing one of these will be go to a preservation railway or a museum and, and measure, the, measure the thing up, go to a factory, probably, you know, typically your own factory, and produce the thing. Um, you know, you, you, we, didn't, we couldn't do that with a GT3 because there was no living example. We, we have living examples of the Shea, uh, but because of COVID, then obviously I couldn't, you know, travel into the States without, you know, being sterilized for two weeks. Right. Um, and, uh, and then obviously, you know, um, to go visit and, and, and see it, see everywhere. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it has produced challenges Whoop. as far as that goes, but we've, we've overcome those with, um, I mean, like one of the other models that we're doing, the leader that, that doesn't exist either, but we've still managed to, you know, uh, right. that's, that's well into Thule now. All right. So let's That'll just, I year. just got one last question then. Uh, I love how he just went to American Freight Car or Freight Car America and just said, <laughs> give me your plans. I don't think he asked. I think he told them to. He said, and I'm sure they, and you know, and I'm sure they probably did. And I know that I've tried with some of those companies at times when a model's coming out and have done some emails and stuff asking, would you have plans of this? Or, you know, this is new and I'm, in, and I don't get much response. So I'm going to ask him in the future to well, ask for whatever I'm looking yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I keep thinking of that interview we did with Matt Donnelly. And, you know, I was asking him questions like, okay, so Amtrak's going to have some special fares this uh, this summer. And he's like, well, I really can't speak to that. And I'm thinking, it's on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we got the other side of the coin uh, where uh, uh, Keith just doesn't seem to want to, wants to tell us as much as he possibly can, mm-hmm. which is really... Oh, yeah. Which is really fun. So, what's the very first one of these freight cars you're going to produce? Um, I mean, we we, we want to do the um, the short bodied hopper uh, because that that is the, there's definitely a huge gap in the market for that one. Um, the, the 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 little hopper. He's um, he's begging to be made. So going forward, now I guess I guess what your uh, the next thing you're going to try the fun thing that will be talking to you over the years will be what you discover the differences are between the North American and uh, European market. What's the, what's the, what's the one thing that has surprised you so far dealing with North American modelers and British or European modelers? Um, th- there's not a huge gap, actually. There's no, there's no huge, great, um, you know, difference between um, the different markets. I mean, uh, the passion is still there for what they want. They, you know, obviously North American buyers typically know what they want and know the quality that they want and and, and expect it, and, and that goes without saying. So, um, yeah, I mean, as I say, we, we've had some very positive emails uh, from from North American customers saying, "Hey, when's this coming out? You know, we really love it. It's been been so long. I've always wanted one." Um, I mean, the only thing we have had is, well, you're not doing HO thirty. Well, it's. It, it's it's such a narrow potential that we we could um, I mean the body would be about the same size the only thing that would change would be the trucks so we could we could remodel the trucks and bring it out that as a later stage as a as a as, as a potential option for the uh, HO thirty uh, brigade. I just figured this out, Tony. What's that? This is Martin Jenkins because he said HO. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> no, no, I did. I did not. I did not con Marty into okay. putting a. Yeah, no, no All April right. Fools. Yeah. This, this is cool. This is going to be cool. This is going to be very, very exciting, Keith. And I really do look forward to talking to you as we go along, keeping updated on all the stuff because it's going to be fun to see, you know, all the different challenges and the successes that you have. I mean, I'm excited to see how many. Uh, like I. Pff, if this Shay is what it should, what you think it will be, and the way you produced the uh, your other, if it comes out that way, this thing will just absolutely explode onto the North American market. I mean, oh, absolutely, I totally agree. People, people will go nuts for this. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, so I guess you can't tell us how many you're going to make. Mm, no, not yet. Uh, <laughs> they will be made to order. So, so that, that uh, I mean, you know, basically, if you if you have have not pre-ordered it by the time we close the order book, the chances are you won't get one. 
So will you reproduce it? If we get enough interest like we did with the GT3, absolutely. Okay. Because because we'll own all the all the tools. To all right. It. Well, let me ask you Just... qu- let me ask you a question, and this is my last question, and then we gotta let you go. Um, why wouldn't you make I don't know a hundred or two hundred more? Uh, just uh, have them on hand so that as people find it, find the model, they like. This is the one thing that seems to be has become a, the standard. Only although it's not with, air, with Arrowhead models or with Tangent models. Both of those guys, they make them and then they sell them. Uh, why has it become the standard that you wouldn't absolutely wouldn't make another hundred of them to have to sell after people find out about this? Oh, I mean, we, we, we produce enough to cover any warranty or repair issues or damage in transit, that kind of thing. So so then after the warranty's expired, then obviously then we'll have a, a small amount of inventory to, to sell on. But yeah, I mean, it's it's not like we're going to produce 10,000 of these things with only a customer base of 1,000. No, okay. But why wouldn't you produce 1,200 of them? Because uh, 1,000 people want them. So eventually you're going to sell the other ones. Well, that's, yeah, that's that's exactly what we do do. Is is we uh, is we, we we produce enough to cover the orders, okay, now and, and and then have a small amount left over to cover any warranty and repair issues, right. and then as I say, once the warranty and that lot's expired, and no more people are going to come forward and say, "Hey, my model's broke," um, you know, we'll have a, a small amount, you know, be it one, two, three hundred, or whatever, um, to be able to, you know, to to put on the open market. Okay, so you will have forget the warranty and uh, that all that other stuff. So your intentions are to have have more than just what is ordered. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's not, you know, if, if there's a thousand customers, we're going to produce a thousand trains, no. Um, do you think in the future, as you pay attention to it, are you, uh, you, seem, you seem to me to be a guy that's very open to going, all right, well, I made a mistake there. I'm going to change the way I do things going forward. Like, uh, do you see, because uh, you can't argue with the fact that David Leobach at Tangent uh, Scale Models, I mean, that guy makes 6,000 freight cars and brings them in and, who buys them, buys them. And I kind of admire that about him uh, these days because, uh, you know, he does it the total opposite way of everybody else. So do you see as time goes along where you go, geez, every model I make, I'm selling, there's always a demand afterwards. So is that in the back of your mind that you may somehow change your your uh, concept one day? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's always the goal to to have constant inventory uh, to keep going, but I mean, we're not going to supply retail and lose thirty percent or forty percent profit instantly. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can, uh, you know, we, as I say, with having the fulfillment warehouse, we just hold stock in there, and then as as people order one, then we can we can sell that on. But but right now, obviously, um, as a as a young fledgling company that that is is literally just just breaking into North America, we we have to be very mindful of the. Of the fact of, of of producing inventory that we may or may not sell. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it, go, it goes without saying that you know that, that there is still room room for maneuvering and, and and room for 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 growing in the industry here here in this particular market, and it's it's uh, it's it's still a fledgling fledgling market for us. So we, we need to be embraced by the by the modeling community and the and the in the droves that we need to to keep us going yeah you sound like a guy that enjoys flying by the seat of your pants mm, no I, I i like a uh a, a stable environment for for sure you know and, and, okay. and knowing knowing where the sales are coming from absolutely all right but yeah. the, but you're gonna yeah all right well, well well you know what we'll learn as you learn we'll learn we'll learn along with you because we'll get you back on here you can irritate me again for another 30 or 40 minutes and then we'll go <laughs> <over>. <laughs> <laughs> As the years go by, I simply became known as the Grumpy Podcaster. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Pretty cool, eh, Tony? It's it's very, you know, and I said this, and I don't think you believe me at first. You know, I gave you the guy's name. I said, we've got to get this guy on the podcast. This is amazing. It's incredible. And I could tell you were like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll get to it, you know, that I, you're you're hyping this that you know you're the magazine editor that's out here with you know news and reviews. It's like sure, sure, I've been there, done that before. And then when you first talked to, because you talked to Keith before I had, I had emailed with him, but I hadn't until tonight on video and talking is the first time he and I have actually you know other than email. But when you talked to him a week or two ago, I think he like called me immediately afterwards saying. 
this is amazing. This guy, this is this company. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Why do you think I said we need to talk to this guy? <laughs> or he or, did. Or, now, or, that's or, what he that's what he did, Keith. Or, I'm sitting I'm working on the magazine with my assistant editor. We're doing like a Zoom thing, working on stuff. And I got Lionel going, this guy's just amazing. And all this stuff he's going to do. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I told you like a month ago. Yeah. Or we could uh, we could go the other route. And uh, you couldn't be bothered, so you sent your your flunky to go talk to him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, although I'm not really, I don't really do flunky that well. Um, Okay, so that's it. Tony, can you give out our email address? You'd like to drop an email to us at the Great Modelers Life Podcast, so we do read emails. Actually, you know, I think some places don't read emails, but they actually you actually do. Go to a Modelers Life dot com and there's a send us an email it's a big blue square with bruce the mildly agitated male boys picture you click on that and you can send an email to your favorite podcast and again that's a modelers dot com and modeler has one l like like one l like railroad railroad yeah no i don't i don't think railroad has an l in it R- railroad one L, okay. Railroad. Doesn't what? What's the railroad show? The show Warley. Yeah, yeah. that's but, what I was. That's what I was waiting for you to say. Has one L like that, not an R like Warley? Oh, I thought you. I thought you'd be right there. See, it's not my job. I asked you to do the. Email. Okay, sorry. So yes, yeah. There you go. So modelerslife dot com and click on the send us an email. There you can find out everything about the Patreon channel. Uh, find out where to download the free podcast through Libsyn, iTunes, YouTube. All that stuff. So modelerslife.com is your portal to get in on the fun and excitement. Uh, it's uh, one L like Worley, not two L's like Ravel. There you go. Oh, boom, boom. Yeah, that's what I was Sheesh. waiting for. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mr. Smarty Pants. All right, sorry. Uh, and if you want to get, hey, Keith, if you want to get an AML t-shirt or a mug or a hoodie or just about anything you could possibly need, if you go to Midwest Model Railroad, Right there in uh, downtown Independence, Missouri. And they have, uh, the store just grows and grows and grows. If you want to go there and uh, you can go there to their website, MidwestModelRR.com and go to the navigation bar and click on AML and boom, it's a wonderland of AML merchandise. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have a wonderland of merchandise yet? Uh, Actually, we do. Yeah. I, I can send you a bumper sticker, a window sticker, and I pick T-shirts up on Friday. Well, there you go, perfect. Uh, I like the I like the intro. I'm looking at your uh, your uh, YouTube now of the uh, of the concert or decorated sample. Wow, look at that. That's pretty sweet. That's a good looking model right there, buddy. It's a rake, eh? Nine yep. cars in a rake. A yep. rake. There you go. See, now you're speaking the language. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I went past the house of the garage. Mm, well, there's that. Yeah. Did they have any? Did they have any decals <laughs> on their cars? <laughs> uh, I actually, I actually drive a mini. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Uh, how tall of a man are you? Six three. Are you? Wow. Really? Are you really? Uh, mm-hmm. And you jam yourself into a mini? Yeah. I have to prize myself out with a shoehorn. <laughs> <laughs> I have to grease myself up just to get in. Uh, uh, okay. So at the end of the show, Keith, you have to say uh, happy rails to you. Okay. Do you think you can do that? There's no singing. There's no interpretation. There's no nothing. You just. How, how come it can't be sung? That's an idea. I mean, like kind of the old, you know, Roy Rogers strumming guitars, the <clears throat> crackling of the campfire. I mean, why don't we get, I mean, we, we were asked about a drum roll. Whoever does the drum roll, can they not strum a guitar at the end? If we, that's why if, the, if, think, if we bring in a musician, you know, if we did that? I think that's how this uh, podcast got off to a bad start, was right out of the box. He's like, is there a drum roll? And it's like, you know. <laughs> Well, you know what I'm going to do? I, I'm taking a cue from Keith. I'm going to Google musicians for podcasts <laughs> and see if I can find one, and I'll just get one lined up. And this won't happen again. I'll uh, get this taken care of. Um, do you know why there's uh, he can't sing it? Why? The, the the reason is because the word evil means exactly what it is. The evil uh. overlord says there's no singing. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So at the appropriate moment, Keith, you have to say happy rails to you with enthusiasm. Okay. Now, do you mean he has to say happy rails to you with enthusiasm or with enthusiasm? He says happy rails to you. Well, I, I lost the direction there. Okay. It's happy rails to you. Okay. I got it now. You got it now? I think I do. But you're not saying it. You're just. Wa- well, but I wanted to be clear on this because I didn't understand what was going to happen. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I got it instantly. Oh, see, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. See, the guy that's building the shade gets it. The guy that just writes about it and takes the pretty pictures, no idea what's happening. See, I don't have to. Yeah. I let <laughs> people do the work and I just report on it. Yeah. I have, hey, Keith, the one time I offered to do a book review for Tony, but he'd already, right. given, he'd already given it away to somebody else. I apparently didn't even make the short list. I didn't even make a, I didn't make the long list. I didn't even make a, a passing thought. He just like, oh, no, I've given that job to somebody else. <laughs> now, now, Keith, think about this, though. After spending two hours in this podcast situation, and I need like a thousand word book review, do you not think I'd end up, it would be the hundred pages of Model Railroad News of Lionel going, you know, here's the thing about books. <laughs> It'd be, you know, and it would go, I, I don't even know how I'd start to edit this down into a review. So, no. Well, you'd, I, well, you'd, you'd have got it in, in like biblical format, but you'd, exactly. have got it, like, you'd have got it three months late. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Because <laughs> he, he wouldn't believe you sent the book in the first place. That's true. Yeah, I would get him right there when it showed up. Yeah. Yeah. That's like that's like we have uh, 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 we do this thing, uh, song of the day, and one of us continually says, "Well, music from the '60s is too old," and I'm always going, "Well, it's the birthplace of rock and roll. It's the birthplace of all music." What song are you going to do tomorrow, Tony? I don't. I can't remember what song I did today. But yeah, I've been kind of on this like seventies whatever rock stuff lately. So probably I've got another song like that, I think, in me this week, yeah. Yeah. Like uh yeah. I think I'm gonna go I might go Beach Boys tomorrow. Oh, that'd be a good one, yeah. Oh, I'd follow with something there then, yeah. All right. All right. I think I I every time I need a pick me up I go uh Sloop John B. Hmm. You can't if you can't tap your toes to that, you're not tapping your you're, you're, you're there's no blood flowing. There you, you need go. Some Beatles. The oh, Beatles. Yeah. Eh, yeah. Ticket to ride. Uh what's the No, not ticket. There's another one. No, anyways. Are you ready, <laughs> Keith? Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, Keith, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing left. I uh... Oh. Oh. <laughs> wow. You had one job. <laughs> Man. We're gonna have to get him, we're gonna have to get him cue cards. I can see the tumbleweed from here. <laughs> <laughs> Just rolling across the back forty. There okay, everybody back to places, shut the barn door, get the horses back in here, raise the sun back up to the half mass mark, and then we'll start over. Okay. Uh, we're ready. Are you ready now? I was ready before. Oh uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Trying to find uh, there's a song. Oh, there's a song I might do. Ubla di ubla da. Oh, there's a good song. Get back. That's the one I was thinking of. Get back is my favorite Beatles song. What's your favorite Beatles song, Keith? Uh, Ticket to ride. Well, Keith, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life, and the sun slowly sets over the back forty, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say, "Happy rails to you." Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol Motor Court and Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumba Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer.